Chapter 1 The room was small and received precious little daylight. It was on the wrong side of the house, and the walls covered in dark and absurdly pretentious paper hangings seemed to close in on him as Fitzwilliam Darcy dropped his hat and gloves on the nearest table and strode towards the fireplace. He frowned. Many would say that the step he was about to take was ill-judged in the extreme. Madness, they would call it. Sheer madness. Yet it could not be helped. Nay, it could not be helped. He ran his hand over his mouth and chin, drew a deep breath, and turned around to face the only sunlit corner of the parlour, where Elizabeth sat, bathed in a golden glow, at the table by the window. His eyes warmed as he took in the enticing sight. Fitting, the soft light which through yonder window breaks, for she is the sun, he thought, and a hint of a smile tugged at the corner of his lips when he found himself paraphrasing the bard like a besotted youth. Nevertheless, she was a ray of sunshine. He had thought as much from the earliest days of their acquaintance. She was all that was bright and good. Her cheerful disposition, the warmth of her love, the heat of passion. She stood to bring all that into his life, and more besides. True companionship, a blissful and rewarding union, a life with her would undoubtedly provide more than ample compensation for the censure that his choice would hasten to attract. Lips tightened, Darcy banished all thought of naysayers and the forthcoming storm. He was his own man, after all, and nobody's fool. And who but a weak-minded fool would be swayed from his course of action in something quite so personal as this? Of course he would do his duty, he always had, and always would. But henceforth he would do it as he saw it, with Elizabeth beside him. He would secure his heart's desire, secure her, and if the world at large could not understand that happy men did their duty better, then the world could go hang. All of a sudden the words were out, as though of their own volition. In vain I have struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. His lungs filled with air, and a blessed sense of peace washed over him, now that the deed was done and the long-withheld avowal was out into the open. Every trace of doubt and all his natural and just misgivings fell away like a discarded coat, leaving him almost giddy with relief, and his heart lighter than a feather. He gave a faint dismissive little shrug as he continued. In declaring myself thus, I am fully aware that I will be going expressly against the wishes of my family, my friends, and, I hardly need add, my... Damnation! The expletive was held back more by luck than judgment, and instead of giving full vent to his displeasure at the interruption, Darcy merely turned around to glare at the opening door. The young maid, blameless recipient of his vexation, dared not say a word, but bobbed a flustered curtsy and stepped out of the way to make room for Colonel Fitzwilliam. All that the newcomer was allowed to offer was a brief greeting, before Darcy forestalled him. This is not a good time, he said crisply. I would appreciate it if you gave us a moment. The flash of apologetic comprehension in the colonel's eyes told Darcy that, although he had not taken his cousin into confidence, not fully, Fitzwilliam had astutely grasped precisely what it was that he had interrupted. Yet instead of making himself scarce with due haste, he grimaced and advanced into the room. I hope you will forgive me, he said to both his mien suitably contrite. But you are needed at Rosings, cousin. I thought I might find you here. And so you have. Darcy cut him off. Pray let Lady Catherine know I will attend her as soon as— It was his turn to be unceremoniously interrupted. It cannot wait, Fitzwilliam declared without equivocation. We have reason to fear that Anne has eloped. To own the truth, with Wickham—